morning. Do you remember the first time you felt embarrassed? I mean, I mean really embarrassed. I remember one of the first times, I was in grade three, and I used to love making bracelets. It's, it's a real, uh, you know, grown-up thing to do, but I love making bracelets, beaded bracelets. And I remember I made this one bracelet, I was super proud of it, it had, you know, different color beads on it, and I would wear it to school, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. When I was in grade three, I also began realizing that some girls don't have cooties anymore. Um, <laughs> I started to, you know, like girls. And I also realized that some of my guy friends also started to like girls. And some of them also started to like the same ones as me. And so I remember one day there was a guy who I, I kind of didn't like him because I'm like, he likes her and I like her and we're enemies now forever. And so we, we were having a debate about something and he accidentally grabbed onto my bracelet and broke it. And I started bawling my eyes out in the middle of class, like just crying hysterically. And I, I was so embarrassed. And um, the teacher comes over and she's like, why, why are you crying? And I was like, my bracelet broke. And I remember she said something like, it's just a bracelet. So why are you, it, it, why, I don't, she just looked very confused. And I was so embarrassed because I was crying about this thing that I made that broke. And no one really felt what I was feeling. And I wanted them to feel what I was feeling. So I said, well, the reason I'm crying is because my grandma made me this bracelet. And then she died right after she made it. <laughs> and... It actually worked. Like, my teacher was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I was like, yes, I lied and it worked this time. Like, I, I was so hurt and I wanted people to feel what I felt, that I manipulated them, I lied to them, I tricked them into feeling what I was feeling. Have you ever been embarrassed before? Have you ever felt like no one really got the way you were feeling? See, when I was growing up, I think I grew up like many of us did, with a mistrust of emotions. Emotions were something that should not be sought after. I was taught that I should seek after thinking and knowledge, but emotions, those are what make you weak. Uh, I grew up, my, my mom experienced a severe depression as I was growing up, and I saw the pain that it caused her. And in my mind, I thought, you know, sadness is evil. Hurt is bad. And if I can avoid those feelings, then life will be much better. I was so against hurt. I actually saw... Um, when you look at people, I saw those who make people laugh, people flock to them. The funny people, people love funny people. But those people who complain and cry, they're weird, right? They're emotional. Let's stay away from them. And so I, I decided that I would be the funny guy, that I would make people laugh. And I also learned that big boys don't cry. Men need to be tough, right? And you cannot cry if you're a man. At least you can't let people see it. And so I would do all that I could to be tough. And I would like to say that when I went to church, I began to believe that emotions were something I could express. But when I went to church, I felt like I wasn't allowed to actually show my emotions. You see, I actually believed that it was a sin to cry. I thought that if I worried, if I was upset, it means I didn't have enough faith. I'm supposed to have the joy of the Lord all the time. And so I, was, I would not allow myself to be upset, especially at church. And maybe you're here today and church isn't your thing. Maybe it's your first time in a church. And you, when you think of people who go to church, you think that they use religion as a crutch. That they are so emotionally needy that they need some airy-fairy God to help them feel better. I want to tell you that I grew up in the church and I believe emotions were bad. I believe that it was the opposite of what I needed to do. I thought as long as I knew about God, I would be close to him. And so I pursued education, I pursued degrees in theology, which is the study of God, and I wanted to learn as much as I could about God so that we could get close. I came to realize what I'll talk about, you later, talk about with you a bit later is this idea of knowing God is more important than knowing about God. And maybe you're here, and, and like I said, if church isn't your thing, maybe you've decided that, you know, God isn't real, and maybe you've Googled God. <laughs> You Googled all the different thoughts about God. You looked up, you watched all the YouTube videos, you read all the books, and you decided in your heart and in your mind that, that God cannot possibly be real. I would challenge you that instead of trying just to know about God, I would encourage you to try and actually know God. And so I grew up, and I discounted my emotions. Emotions were worthless. They just hurt people. And then I got married and had some kids. <laughs> I began opening up, kind of, a little bit. I saw other people close to me really feeling, and I couldn't really 
avoid them because I lived with them. And, but you can ask my, my wife. I still denied my emotions. I, I would, you know, not actually tell her how I feel. And she would say, oh, how, how come you're not upset? And I'm like, I am. And just be totally still. And then my wife entered into a season of depression as well. And that was very extremely difficult for her. And I didn't realize at the time that it was difficult for me as well. Because I grew up with seeing my mom's depression and thought depression is evil and it hurts people and emotions are evil. And then my wife entered that and I didn't realize all those feelings were coming back. And so I didn't know how to fix my wife. Ladies, you know men want to fix things. <laughs> I wanted to fix my wife. I wanted to make her better somehow. But no matter how many things I reasoned with her, it wouldn't make a difference. It was hard. But when I saw her strength, and when I saw her vulnerability at the same time, that she was actually able to express how she was feeling, it radically changed me because I'm like, I love her even more. And she's feeling. It impacted me. And I've been on a journey over the past few years towards emotional health. And I've experienced some things that I want to share with you, but I really think I'm not, I'm not perfect. I don't believe anyone is emotionally 100% perfect or perfect in any way, but I have learned some things and I would like to share them with you because I believe that there is hope. I believe that I have experienced transformation and I believe that you can too. Because perhaps, perhaps you were like me. I mean, we were all raised in this Western culture where, where reason is superior to all else, where we focus on what we think, where we judge emotional people why can't they get over it? Why can't they toughen up? What's wrong with them? And we always avoid bad emotions. Oh, don't get around them. They're a negative Nancy or whatever we call them. Stay away from negative people. Perhaps like me, your childhood also shaped your worldview. It shaped the way you see emotions because of the emotional responses you had and people had around you. Maybe you, maybe you think it didn't, but maybe you've seen it in others. I would suggest maybe you have some denial, but you might see it in, in those you love, at least. Like I said, if you grew up outside of the church, you may have always avoided church because it's for those emotional people. I believe if you grew up inside the church, I think that the church, when I say church, I mean big C church, all of the church, I think we've approached emotion in two negative ways, two, two ways that are incorrect. The first way, I believe, is for some of us, we see God as the person we come to when we have deep emotional needs only. So like, I come to God when I feel ashamed and that's how we connect. We connect by my shame, so I keep doing that thing that makes me feel ashamed and that's how we get close. Or through, through the hurt that we've experienced, I only come to God because he heals me from my past hurts and that sort of thing. So there's that side where God is only an emotional connection, but then there's a side where God isn't an emotional connection, where God is just connected on what we know about him. That's, that's, I, I kind of pursued both of these in my life, um, but the, the, um, that's where we read books about God and we learn about God and we study about God and we come to, to reason and convince ourselves that God is real. But I believe that no matter where your emotional health is, no matter what experiences have shaped it, that Jesus paints a better picture for emotional health. So I want to take you guys through a narrative today in the, in the scriptures and it's a really cool story because it, uh, it shows us some great things about emotional health. And so if you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you um, before you leave today to get one. If you go to the info booth, they'll find you one. If you can't find one, come find me. I'll, I'll give you one. Um, there'll be some on these tables here. But if you have a Bible with you now or a phone, I would encourage you to go to John chapter 11. Uh, John was one of the, the guys who followed Jesus around as he lived on this earth. And he saw what Jesus did. He heard what he said. And he recorded it in this what we call the Gospel of John, the good news according to John. And so I'm going to show you guys uh, the easiest passage in the whole Bible to memorize. And you'll feel great because after you leave today, you'll say, at least I did one thing. I memorized the part of the Bible. And so here it is. It's the easiest verse. is John 11, verse 35. is Jesus wept. How many of you already have it memorized? You, great job. We're done. All right. Um, but this verse, Jesus wept, it's so simple. But it's so profound. These two words have huge power in them for our lives. And so how do we get to this point? How do we get to a point where Jesus is weeping? Well, Jesus was in the region of Judea, and he decided that it would be a good idea to leave that region because people were trying to stone him. Uh, it wasn't safe, so he left, which is, I would say is a pretty good idea. And while he was out in another region... They got word that there was this guy who's named Lazarus, who's from the town of Bethany, which is in Judea, 
where he was, Lazarus was sick. Lazarus is sick, and Lazarus has a sister named Martha and a sister named Mary. This Mary was the same Mary who uh, her, she used her tears in her hair to wash Jesus' feet and anointed him with oil. They, they were very close. Actually, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were Jesus' good friends. And so Martha and Mary sent notice to Jesus saying, Our brother is sick. Will you please come heal him? We know because we're close that you're the miracle worker. Please come heal our brother. They said, The one that you love is sick. And so Jesus responds and he tells those around him, he said, don't worry guys, this sickness won't lead to death. It, he'll be fine. But, you know, I love him, so, so let's go. And after a couple days, he went to visit Lazarus. And the disciples were like, Jesus, you can't go back to Judea. That's where they want to stone you. Why would you go there? It, like, just stay here where it's safe. And Jesus responds in some weird metaphor, which basically means when God calls you to go somewhere, you go. And I know some of you have experienced that. You're like, I don't know why I'm doing this, but God wants me to, and I think it's right. And so Jesus leads the disciples in that way. And then Jesus says to them, oh, our friend Lazarus fell asleep. And they're like, so he'll wake up. He's taking a nap. He'll be fine. And Jesus is like, oh, I was trying to be nice. Actually, Lazarus died. Lazarus has died. This is crazy. You knew he died, and he wasn't even there. Lazarus died. And this next part is key. Jesus then says to them, I am glad that this happened for your sake, that you might believe. I mean, I'll be, believe what? Right? Your friend just died and you're glad? That's odd. And so Jesus gets to Bethany with the disciples and he finds out that Lazarus has been dead for four days and he's been buried for four days. And there was a, a bunch of Jews that came from Jerusalem to come and comfort Martha and Mary. And Martha hears that Jesus is near and she runs out. And so I want to... This is what Martha says when she comes to Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 21. She says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, Martha, she states the truth. Martha says, Jesus, if you were here, you're the miracle worker, my brother wouldn't have died. And Martha then goes on to rely on her reason. She, she says some things to Jesus. Let's go to the next passage. She says this, but I know that even... Now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He will rise again. Jesus says to Martha, he will rise again. Martha observes the situation and replies with what she knows to be true. She says, I know in the last days you're going to do something great and people will rise from the graves and everything will be good. And Jesus affirms this. He affirms her, her reasoning and he says, do you believe that this is true? I just want to pause and give you an opportunity to reflect on that, that question for your own life. Do you believe that Jesus has the power to resurrect you? To resurrect those you love? Do you believe that this is true? And then the next verse, Martha says this. She says, yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. She says, I believe that you are, you are Jesus. I believe that you are the one who's going to save and who's going to raise people. She declares her belief in what he's offering, the resurrection in the final days. But I believe that Jesus is offering something much more. Because Martha then goes and she talks to her sister, Mary. And she says, Mary, the Lord is looking for you. You need to go and see him. So Mary runs off and all the people come following her. And she, they're like, she's probably going to the grave to mourn her brother. So they run after her. And Mary gets there. And she says this phrase to Jesus. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. No, that's not a typo. She said the exact same words as her sister, Martha. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you were here, he would still be alive. Why? Why weren't you here? But see, where Martha, Martha over here came to Jesus, and she said what she knew, and then she responded with reason. Mary on the other side, Mary, watch this, what she does in verse 33. Look at the next verse. She says, when Jesus saw her weeping, Martha responded with reason. Mary responded with emotions. 
She, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where Martha used reason, Mary used emotion. Martha came with a problem to be solved, looking for answers. And Jesus met her there and gave her the answers she needed. Mary came to Jesus weeping, in need of comfort, in need of compassion, in need of just someone to be with her. And Jesus met her where she was and gave her what she needed. Jesus knew what they needed. Could you imagine if Mary came weeping and Jesus responded with reason? I think it would be a little bit difficult for Mary. She's here crying and Jesus is like, he'll, he'll be fine. He'll raise in the last day. Don't worry. And Mary's like, I, I, okay. Like, it would be difficult. And imagine if the other side, Martha's over here asking for answers and Jesus just starts weeping with her. It, Jesus met them where they were at. And this is what I want you to know is that Jesus values both reason and emotion. Both are valuable. He knew even though they're both asking the same questions, he knew where they were at and how to engage them. One with reason, one with emotion. He felt with Mary. He didn't just reason with her, he felt with her. In verse 34 to 36, we read this. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. In verse 36, the Jews said, See how he loved him. It's the easiest passage to memorize, like I said. It's odd that the easiest passage to memorize is one where Jesus is overwhelmed by emotions. I find that quite profound because many of us would call tears and sadness a negative emotion. And yet here's God himself crying. Why did he cry? Because he loved. Someone who he loved had just died. Someone who he loved had just died. This is the first thing I need you to know today, is that God has emotions. God has emotions. Maybe you've never thought that about God. Maybe you think of him as some absent, distant person. But the God we believe in is a relational God. He connects with us. He feels with us. He created emotions. In fact, we are said as the, as the Bible says that we are made in the image of God. We are made in his likeness. If God has emotions, we have emotions. He made our emotions. Throughout scripture, there's a variety of emotions that are um, attributed to God. It says he delights. He grieves. He feels pain, jealousy. He cries out. He experiences fierce anger. He loves. He shows compassion. He feels sorrow, feels troubled, feels distressed and joyful. Our God experiences emotions and he sees them as good. See, I love this passage because Jesus knew that a miracle would happen. I'm sorry, spoiler alert. But Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew that he could raise Lazarus from the dead. In fact, he told the disciples, remember I told you this is key, he said, I am glad that he died. I'm glad that it happened so that you might believe. Jesus went to Bethany knowing that when he got there, Lazarus would be dead and that he had the power to raise him. He even said to Martha, if you believe, you'll see great things. But when he came and saw the people he loved weeping and he saw that his friend was dead, Jesus still felt. He still wept. Even though he had full faith, he still cried. Why? Why? Because his friend died. Someone who he loved experienced the worst possible thing. And the people who he also loved were grieving. How many of you guys know that emotions can be contagious? For all of you who watch This Is Us on Netflix, I'm not crying, you're crying. It's true. So we always never make eye contact after that show. Uh, just kidding. But Jesus wept. This is the truth I want you to know from this. Is that Jesus wept because he has emotions. And that if Jesus can weep, so can I, so can you. Not only does he feel, but God values your emotions. God values my emotions. He saw Mary in her state, an emotional wreck, and he didn't shame her. He didn't tell her to get up. He didn't tell her to toughen up. 
he embraced it. He pursued it. He loved her in it. He had no expectations for her to change and notice she didn't apologize for the way she was feeling. He joined her there. The final thing I want you to know about God and how he sees emotions is that God joins me in my emotions. God joins you in your emotions. He didn't explain, he joined. He didn't reason with her, he felt with her. And we read that he was motivated by love. Motivated by love. He wept because he loved. You know, if I reflect back on my life in that season where I focused on knowing all about God and not knowing God, I find it quite, quite, quite odd because I knew in my heart that the deepest moments in my faith all had to do with when I felt God, when I actually felt his presence, when I felt his love. But yet I focused on how much I could know about him instead. And knowing is good. I mean, the more I learn about my wife, usually the closer we get. I, just, yeah, the more you know, the more I know about her, the closer we get. But when we actually experience things together, when we cry together at the same hurts, when we laugh together at the same funny things, when we get angry at the same injustices, we're actually getting closer together because we are feeling together more than just knowing about things. And the same is true for God. Mark said last week um, that, that Jesus is in the business of replacing our lies with truth. And I believe that one of the most powerful ways Jesus does this is by joining us in our emotions. Because knowing about God isn't the goal. Knowing God is. It's interesting because in the Bible, the word, the phrase to know that is used so many times has this, this meaning that is more than just to know in your head. Sometimes the, the original languages in the Bible, their words are a little different than ours. And, and the phrase to know, it can mean anything from knowing about something to knowing someone sexually. I would argue that those are very different things. And so... It has this, this sense of intimacy, this sense of knowing. And you know what's interesting? When we think about intimacy, the most intimate way to know someone is physically, then emotionally, and then rationally. Yet when it comes to God, we tend to live in the rational world. And we just approach God from this way, and we wonder why we can't get very intimate with him or with, with those we love. Its most significant usage of the phrase to know is about God knowing someone in their entirety, every part of them. Maybe, maybe you've never thought of God in that way, that he knows everything about you, whether you want him to or not, he does. And he pursues you in that. Lots of us think that uh, God just looks at our emotions, but he doesn't just see them. He joins us in them. And so if this is true, if God has emotions, if he values our emotions, and he joins me in my emotions, how then... Should we approach emotions? Well, I remember there was a season in my life, a time in my life, where I was expecting another child. We, we, my wife was pregnant, and I was, you know, I should have been excited, and I should have been a bit nervous, right? For those of you who have kids, it's a bit of both. I'm excited, and I'm nervous. When my wife had gone through a terrible pregnancy uh, in, in her mental health, it, it just hurt her. And it was hard. And I, I'm sitting here saying, I'm about to have a baby. And either my wife's going to get worse, and that's terrifying, or she's going to get better, and that's exciting. But at the same time as that happened, I had some drastic changes happen in my workplace. I entered a season of deep uncertainty, fear, nervousness, busyness. I also, at the same time, had some dreams that I wanted that were unrealized. There was some sadness that I should have felt, disappointment. I had re relational dynamics changing that I had to navigate, and I was uncertain how to go through with them. I had new opportunities, though, that caused excitement. But I also, my wife was entering into a time of uh, unpaid maternity leave, and I was afraid. How are we going to get through this? You see, I honestly looked at the different situations. There were so many different emotions coming into my life, and I said, there's too many of them I don't want to feel anymore. I'm just going to ignore them. You know what I mean? I should have felt excited that my baby was going to come, and I was going to hold her in my arms. But I was too distracted by the fear. And I should have felt afraid of those other things, but, but I didn't want to feel it, so I didn't let myself feel excited, and I just went numb. 
I told myself, Daniel, you're a pastor, you're a leader, you can't feel, you're supposed to lead other people. You can't get to a state where you don't feel strong enough. You need to be there for other people. You shape how others go. I decided my problems don't matter because other people's problems are worse. Mine are just little. Look at how much of a hard time they're going through. Why are you even upset? I decided that I would work hard, that I would perform well, and that that would make me feel better. I denied myself the right and the freedom to feel. I remember saying to Brianna one day, my, one of my kids came up and made a joke that was hilarious, and I didn't laugh. And I said to her, I thought that joke was hilarious, and I couldn't laugh. I realized at that moment that I had been making myself so numb to emotions that I wasn't even able to feel the ones that I thought were so desirable. And the truth is, as much as you can try to avoid emotions, you will feel them eventually. And I did, all at once. And I was forced to make a decision. Was I going to continue to deny the fact that I have emotions? Or was I going to embrace them? Because here's the thing, I already did therapy. <laughs> I, already, I already processed through that stuff. I, I, know my, I knew my weaknesses and all that thing. I should be fine. I'm tough. But I was lying to myself. I didn't let myself feel. And I think God brought me to a place where he said, Daniel, I need you to feel. See, I was tired of being numb. And I wanted to feel. And so I decided to begin embracing my emotions. And this is where I came to know Jesus. When I was bawling my eyes out, asking him why these things are happening, why do I feel this way? And I feel him holding on to me, this sense of his presence, saying, I love you, Daniel. I am with you. I am here. When I came to know what the love of a father, a heavenly father, truly means, when I saw my child born and I loved them deeply, when God brought me to these places where I could actually feel, I believe that he changed my life in an amazing way. Feeling is awesome. I look back at a time when I denied myself emotions and I felt like I was constantly trying to be something I wasn't. And when, when I have the ability to feel, I feel freedom. I feel love in deeper ways. The first thing I, I need you to know about how we pursue emotional health is that your emotions are valuable. My emotions are valuable. I had to realize this. Your emotions matter. They have value. I realized that I give something value when I think it has a positive impact, and you probably do too. But I grew up thinking as emotions hurt people, emotions have a negative impact, they have no value. But I saw the positive side of emotions when I would cry with other people and see the bond that connected us, the emotions we shared. When we got angry together, actually shared a bond. Emotions are good. Do you believe that emotions are good? Because I didn't. Do you believe that emotions are good? They are so valuable because they enable us to have true intimacy with God and with others. It, most of us would say that relationships are key in life, that relationships are essential. They're one of the most important things. In order to have strong relationships, we need to have an emotional bond as well. We need to have an emotional connection. The other reason we give something value is if we think that it's trustworthy. But emotions are not trustworthy, are they? Most of us would say you cannot trust emotions. Actually, we've been taught that as a culture. Do not trust your emotions. Focus on reason. Because as many of us might know, our emotional responses have been conditioned by the way we've lived our lives. And so you may respond in a certain emotional way because of the different experiences you've been through. So don't trust your emotions. But you can trust in reason because reason is always right. But I would actually argue that throughout our lives, we've been led to believe certain lies about ourselves and about the way, we're, the way the world works. 
And so we approach things from those lies often. And so our reason can't exactly be fully trusted either. I would argue that actually emotions and reason both have value and they both aren't always trustworthy, but they both tell us things. And I would also argue that emotions, our emotional responses tend to often tell us the reality of what's happening. I want you to think back to the last time someone criticized you. How did you respond? How did you feel? You see, we feel one way, but we say it's okay, it's not a big deal. But that was actually hurtful, and we're allowed to feel hurt by that. Emotions have value. Emotions have value. The next thing I need you to know if you want to approach emotional health in a different way is you need to do this. You need to name and validate your emotions. Name and validate your emotions. When I began actually naming my emotions, saying that I felt this way and I, you know, I felt upset, I felt happy, I felt joy, sadness, anger, whatever, I began to actually find freedom in them. I began to embrace them. I actually began, I actually spend time having conversations with myself, with God, and with others about how I feel. You know, I feel angry at this today that this happened. I write it in my journal to God. I talk to others about it. And here's a key sign of emotional health is the ability to name your emotions. You know you're emotionally healthy or you're at least pursuing emotional health when you can name your emotions. A key sign of emotional unhealth is when someone asks you, how are you feeling? And you say, I don't know. I don't know. Because you actually aren't engaging with your emotions. That's, that's unhealth. Have you ever been there before? Because I've been there before. How do you feel? I don't know. <laughs> and you just kind of mumble junk until whatever. If, you, if you're having a hard time naming and validating your emotions, I would encourage you to grab your phone and look at the emojis and just kind of be like, that's me, right? Whatever one looks like your face, that, that's the one you're feeling. Um, so spend some time looking at emojis because it's really easy to text them, but it's not often easy to name them and validate them in ourselves. Do that throughout the day. Think about the different ways you feel. Think, you know, how am I feeling right now? Look at your, your pictures and see how you feel. And parents, I just, want, I just want to talk to parents. If you, have, if you have kids that are little or that are big or, or, or that are adult children, this is, this is key parenting gold that I learned. If we are able to name and validate our kids' emotions, it will increase our relational health, which we're talking about next week. It will create a deeper bond between us. It'll help them process through the hard times in their lives better. I want you to think about the last time, you know, a kid, for example, a kid's my age will come up to me and be like, it's no fair, my friends got more Halloween candy in their lunchbox than I did. And it's like, so what? It's Halloween candy, get over it. And like, it's just candy, why are you so worried? And our kid's there, and they're like, really upset. They've been thinking about it since lunch for three hours, about how terrible it was that they didn't get candy. And we said, why are you feeling Stop feeling, be tough. I want you next time when a kid comes up to that kind of, in that kind of way, just simply say something like this, like, that must hurt. You seem upset about that. And watch how they respond. Watch how they respond. Because they will feel like they are heard, they will feel like they're valuable because they feel better than we do. They haven't believed as many lies about how the world works as we do yet. And so I would encourage you to name and validate your emotions. Finally, in order to pursue emotional health, I need to share my emotions. I need to share my emotions. This is what changed my life, I think. In Galatians chapter 6, it says this, Carry each other's burdens, and in this you will fulfill the law of Christ. So you mean in order to do what God wants me to do, I just need to carry other people's burdens? I was like, that, that sounds really easy, right? But that's so against the way our world works. When we see people who are upset, we see them as a burden. And yet Jesus tells us, come in alongside them and help them carry that burden. When I I realized that people around me were hurting and I, I actually have a role to play in helping them carry that hurt, it was empowering. It actually created a much deeper connection where I usually would avoid those kind of people. Now I, I, I was drawn towards them. Because I was thinking about how Jesus took upon all my burdens upon himself at the cross. And if he can take the entirety of my burdens, I can join someone in their situations, in their hardships. 
And in Galatians, or sorry, in Romans chapter 12, 15, it says this. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. When I started feeling my emotions and I let people join me in them, that was so powerful to see them say that, to validate how I felt, to be upset at the things I'm upset with and to rejoice in the things that I rejoice in. Because our faith is not meant to be lived alone. A lot of us think about as long as me and God are good, it's all good. But it's not just about this connection between us and God. It's about belonging and being a part of his family. And families feel together. We need to feel together. Bring it to others. But if I stop there, then this would just be a self-help message. All you got to do is just talk about your emotions with other people and your life will be better. But there's more than that. We don't just bring it to others. We bring it to Jesus as well. Because validating and naming our emotions might bring some help. But Jesus brings the healing. Jesus is the one who changes it. Jesus is the one who brings us an eternal hope. You see, this story of Lazarus didn't end with Jesus weeping. Jesus didn't just cry and say, oh, well, I wish there was a Messiah here. Jesus actually... Some of the people responded and say, couldn't he have just risen him from the dead? Like, why, why are they crying? And Jesus, it says he was deeply moved. He goes up to the tomb and he says, roll the stone away. And Martha comes back and she reasons, reasons with Jesus and she says, Jesus, he's been dead for four days. It's going to smell nasty. Do not move that stone. And Jesus says to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see something great? You will see the glory of God? And he has the stone rolled away and he prays that God would show his glory through him. And he stands in front of the tomb and he yells, Lazarus, come out. And out walks Lazarus alive. They take the bandages off him and Lazarus has a new lease on life. He's actually risen from the grave. But not only did Jesus raise Lazarus, he himself died on our behalf. And he rose from the grave so we may have eternal life with him. And he tells us that we will raise one day, that we will not stay buried, we will raise with him. And in that place, he will wipe away every tear, he will comfort every affliction, he will rejoice with us. I cannot wait to the day when I can see Jesus face to face, where we can talk through those times and he says, you are here, you are with me, you are loved. And I can't wait to do that together. But what do we do? until that day because for some of us right now is hard right now we feel and we try not to but we need to I want to give you guys an opportunity this morning because I know some of your lives are busy and I know sometimes when you come to church it feels like you leave with another list of things to do but I want you to take this moment to just know God to not know about him but to connect with him. So I want you to think back through the past little while, past couple days, weeks, whatever it is. Think about a time when you didn't allow yourself to feel what you should have felt. Reflect on that. Perhaps it was sadness, anger, fear, joy, Shame, love, excitement. Just name that emotion in your head. Tell yourself how you felt. yourself it was okay to feel that way it is okay to feel I want you to invite Jesus into that emotion if it's sadness invite him to weep with you if it's joy, invite him to rejoice with you. If it's anger, let, feel his anger with you.
because Jesus sees you as valuable and he knows you in your entirety. He sees your emotions as valuable and he wants you to know him in greater ways. I want to invite you to stand as we sing this final song. I love the first line of this song. It says, the struggles that I face, the choices I have made can't stop your love for me. No matter what you have felt, no matter what you have neglected to feel, I want you to know that Jesus loves you so much. It's true with every breath. It's true that even death cannot separate us from his love. I know for some of you, a message like today's is hard because you've been hiding and avoiding so many emotions for so long. I don't want to tell you that's okay. It's okay for things to be hard. I want to invite you for prayer this morning. If you, if you need prayer because you think, I don't actually know God. You know, I've heard some things about him, but I want to actually know him. I would invite you to come to the front and someone will pray with you. If you are in a place where you're saying, this, this season I'm in is too hard for me to feel. I know you're encouraging me to feel it, but I don't want to. I would encourage you to come up to the front for prayer as well. And if you just want prayer for anything, you are more than welcome to be prayed for. Let me just pray for you now as I send you off to you. God, we are so grateful for your presence in our lives. We thank you that you have given us your spirit, Lord, and that you dwell within us. God, I thank you that when we feel, you feel. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to value our emotions, to name them, to validate them, to say that they are good, and to share them with others, God. I pray for those of us who feel like we are in a strong emotional place, God, that you would help us to carry the burdens of others in their sorrows. But God, I pray above all else that you would help us as your church to feel, to know, God, that you are with us and that you love us deeply. God, we pray that you bless us this week. We pray this in your name. Amen. Have a great week.